I'm gonna go ahead and start. So this is a really long <laughs> title um, that uh, I'm so excited to share this with you guys because um, I got the NSF Career Award, which is like a huge, um, which is a huge honor, which is a, it's a pedagogy, pedagogical plus research. So it's to develop, um, you know, uh, student projects and all this stuff in August, 2020, right? And so, um, you know, we've, we've done some stuff, but I feel like it's just starting to, to move. And I've been, I'll tell you guys, you know, what, uh, some history about it and why I'm now beginning to really think about it as a four field methods lab. Um, oh, wow. Okay. So super brief history, um, my own history here. And then I wanted to make sure that this is, this is me talking. I am the principal, but the authors, um, as we say in Lingant, are all, really, all of my students, everyone who, um, everyone in this department has very much contributed to this. So, uh, but any mistakes are mine. So, um, so my history is, is, is something that, you know, as the, the Ling Amp in this department for five, six years now, um, is often, uh, you know, not well known, but uh, from 2004 to 2011, I was at UCLA, and my co-chairs were Linda Garo, who is MedAmp, and Ellie Oak, who is Ling Amp. So I have as much background in, in and not biocultural though, more um, psychocultural and critical MedAmp. Um, we had at UCLA MMAC, which was a weekly meeting on Monday where we talked about mind, medicine, and culture. And we also had on Wednesdays, Discourse Lab. And then um, during those years, has anyone heard of the Center for the Everyday Lives of Families? So this was a four-field project that was um, multi-country, it was huge. Um, Ellie was the, the head of it and uh, it involved um, ethnography in the homes of middle-class families with one to two kids in Los Angeles. And, um, and there were archeologists in our department that were taking pictures of their garages and they used ethno-archeological tracking um, with the video analysis. And a lot of great things have come out of, like great papers have uh, come out of that. So that was happening when I was there. And then my dissertation was really both medical and linguistic. It focused on um, the translation of Chinese medicine in the US. I'm also a licensed uh, physician of Chinese medicine in, in California. There's no license here. So. so then in 2011, when I finished, I actually worked as a qualitative medical anthropologist in the um, in UCLA internal medicine and health services research for five years. And, um, and then I came here in 2015 and started um, with different faculty and, and back. So we added the B being, you know, the biocultural. So it was my first exposure. Actually, um, Rob Boyd was at UCLA and that was who I took my bio class with, right? So I had some experience, but not a whole lot. Um, and, uh, and I've collaborated with so many of the students and faculty here over pretty much from the moment I got here. Um, in 2019, we had a workshop at, and Jason DeCaro and I were PIs for that developing biolinguistic anthropology and then the career. So, just to dive into like the ways we've talked about what are the possible syntheses between biocultural medical anthropology and Lingan. Um, from our website, biocultural strives to understand why people grow and develop as they do and why they may be at risk for health problems. Um, you know, interesting disparity here that I had to go to the Society for Lingan's website to find an explanation for Lingant, so that's something we may want to add to the website, but, um, but there our explanation is exploring and understanding the ways in which language shapes and is shaped by social life from face-to-face -face interaction to global level phenomena. So I just want to 
like put them next to each other because some of the some of the ties aren't always obvious. Um, biocultural, the aim is to understand the relationship between biology, embodiment, culture, and in Lingant, the aim is really overarching aim is to understand the emergence of culture um, in interaction. And the emphasis in biocultural is that, you know, one, this is obviously a very bullet point pared down, that biology is really much more than uh, an understanding of structure and function. Really, culture is linked to biology and culture is biopsychosocial. And the emphasis in Lingant is that language is much more than words. Right. Um, we really look at interaction, right? So how is meaning interpreted? How does it circulate? How um, do different folks who are participants in the interaction or observers of the interaction um, understand the indexical meanings of that? So it, all my students have heard me talk endlessly about indexicality, but it's something that is really central to Lingant, um, where uh, we look at the, I'm looking at just <laughs> um, the, uh, the Persian approach. So like in language, you have linguistics, which takes a very Saussurean approach, which is like, uh, you know, structural symbol meaning, right? Um, very closely associated with the communication model, like the tin can, right? The, the, where we're communicating just one-on-one. -on -one. And here's my meaning, hey, Mike, can't, Here's my meaning, catch it, you know? And then, yeah, you drop the meaning, you know? And so um, so it really situates meaning outside of, of the self. Um, but the Charles Peirce um, created an approach to language that is triadic. So you have the sign and then what it refers to and then what it indexes, the interpretant to the person, right? So that, so that to, depending on age, depending on, gender, depending on background, depending on all these things, you know, I could interpret uh, the meaning of chair or desk differently, right? So it really opens it up to examine how meaning emerges in an action. Less emphasized in, um, in biocultural is interaction, right? Not because it's not recognized, but because just that hasn't been the focus, right? And um, less emphasized in Lingya. So there's a lot on gesture and gaze and movement and interaction with the um, interaction with objects in the world, the, the way we're sitting, if I were to sit here and face with you, you know, there's, there's a ton of that, but not so much emphasis on physiology. And when there has been, people have not incorporated uh, biocultural theory, right? So it's just kind of adding a biomarker. Um, what I think I wanted to emphasize to y'all was the applied focus in biocultural is very well known, right? There's an addressing of inequity and contributing to lasting cultural change in terms of health, healthcare, and human development. The applied focus in Lingant is less well known, but it is to, I use the same language, addressing inequities and contributing to lasting cultural change in terms of linguistic biases and exclusion based on accent or dialect. Um, so an example of this is uh, a lot of, of us, both on the Language and Social Justice Committee and, um, and in the field more generally, have, who's heard of the word gap? <laughs> um, yeah, so the idea that by age four children from middle to high income families are exposed to approximately 30 million, 30 million more words than children from families on welfare. And this is, you know, both sides of the aisle have tried to um, create interventions that train parents to, to, to speak more with their kids, to expose them to more words, right? Um, However, from a linguistic anthropological perspective, you know, ethnographies have, have shown that children in any environment are extremely um, well adapted to that environment and that this reflects a kind of wordism, right? That language is words. So 
So it's measurement based on what is measured in school and often corresponds to middle-class white affluent families, ignoring the linguistic dexterity and kind of way of doing being a person that happens in language in marginalized communities. So it, it really um, orients to a deficit orientation, right? Um, where the communicative practices that differ from the dominant group are viewed as defective and, and are medicalized, really. So this is an intersection with biocultural because um, it situates those folks as, as, as the targets of these programs, right? Um, and massive public health campaigns, right? And it's really tied to the myth that the abilities measured in school are superior to communicative competence in whatever um, community, right? The other, uh, the other thing that I just wanna, I mean, there's been a lot of language and social justice work. It's just not often thought of as very applied field. So I wanted to, to share that with you guys. So the um, Jonathan Rosa has written about the notion of, of languagelessness, right? The idea that bilingual speakers speak no language tolerably. Right, if a child is a speaker of both Spanish and English, they're often considered a, a, long, a lifelong learner, you know, second language, English is a second language, they're set on a track for their life to be kind of uh, non, not successful in the ways that um, native English speakers are. But, you know, if you have an affluent white child who can uh, speak both Spanish and English, they're often praised, right? So. So there's been uh, a lot in the field of education that has tried to create interventions for this. Um, and a lot of scholarship that, that links it back to this one nation, one language ideology that goes back to uh, really Humboldt, 1830. Um, and it devalues again, the linguistic dexterity of racially minoritized populations that leads to a linguistic policing of some, but not others. Um, and it misunderstands structural inequality as a linguistic problem with a linguistic solution. So that the solution is often seen to change, you know, learn how to speak like, you know, and, and you'll succeed. Learn how to speak, have the NPR voice and, you, and everything will be fine, but that's often not actually what happens, right? So the contribution specifically to medical anthropology, um, there's a number of them, there's actually, been a long history of, of Lingant and Medanth uh, collaboration, um, really looking at how interactions between care providers and patients uphold longstanding structural inequalities, like in the most subtle of ways. So if a doctor says, uh, oh, or well, it's shown to guide, it guides it, right, in a certain, in a certain direction. Um, and it, research has looked at how children are socialized uh, as biocultural beings in, through interactions with physicians, with healthcare providers, and how institutional discourses, um, like these posters, um, are taken up by specific individuals and communities and not necessarily, you know, enculturating, like there's, there's resistance there too, there's, there's always, um, some amount of agency. So some examples here that are, are I think, really underscore the possibilities in terms of these two fields coming together are um, uh, Tanya Stiver's work on um, physicians and pediatricians. And uh, their research found um, a really a statistically pretty, uh, pretty high uh, number of pediatricians were less likely to direct children to, child, to questions to children in African-American families um, than they were to direct questions in Latino, Asian, or white families, right? So this really, um, you know, as you're a child and the doctor is like talking to your parent or your caretaker, whoever's there, you know, and then turns to you and says like, are you feeling, you know, a, it learns, it, that's how we learn how to be uh, patients and how to be people and that we matter and that we have a right to have a voice over our own body, right? Um, so from a really young age, this kinds of exclusion, and it, this is not something the doctors know, 
So a lot of times, a lot of us are really focused on transforming structural inequality. Um, and you can have the, you know, the best intentioned physician um, who doesn't realize, right, that they're doing this, right? Because these are like conditioned patterns that, um, you know, language is often, it's, it's just words, right? <laughs> But so, so it's, it's not often on the radar of those of us, for those of us and physicians and lots of folks who wanna transform these long standing patterns. Um, Charles Briggs really has been very active in bringing MedAnth and LingAnt together. Um, his notion of communicability in public health discourse really um, focuses on the access to the production as well as the reception of authoritative knowledge about disease and how it's distributed, right? How it's taken up um, and who, how, what kinds of divisions it creates. Um, so things like just, you know, posters and all kinds of um, public health messaging, right? When you're orienting, um, again, people with great intentions, but when they're orienting to languages, just words, it's, it's not, uh, super clear how that reconstitutes these categories of, um, you know, dirty and um, those who need, you know, guidance from the public health experts. Um, and then Briggs 2016 has written about um, there, it's a really short article, great article, um, where they talk about communicative in, in, inequities in Venezuela, where um, there was a rabies outbreak. And um, the physicians couldn't figure it out because Spanish, right? And, and Wara, I don't know how to pronounce that. I'm, I really, uh, I defer to anyone who does, but there was the local language, right? Um, was, uh, was considered the language of medicine, right? And the parents of these kids who were passing away from rabies, right? And they were, add that to the communicability where these people were considered dirty and they didn't have good healthcare practices. So they were, it was just this inequity upon inequity and it just went on for really far too long and many children died. Um, and, uh, and, and their own language was just uh, positioned as acquiring facts, right? But the real language was Spanish, so they weren't listening to the narrative and the whole story, and they, they missed a rabies outbreak. So in terms of biocultural contributions to Lingam, this is where I think there's a lot of room for growth, um, and what, you know, some of the things that are, that are becoming more clear, that are obvious ways that it can contribute are, you know, understanding how moment-to-moment -moment physiological processes reflect and shape particular interactions. Um, so the directionality being, uh, you know, how culture gets under the skin, but also how we body the world, right? How we show up um, and how environmental or material conditions contribute to longstanding biological patterns. Um, and then how can we, how can we actually take um, quantitative data like physiological measurements and understand them, not just as outcomes or reductions of what's really going on. And so this is where um, Jason DeCaro and Josh Peterson and I uh, began actually in, was it 2016? We got a pilot study and then we got a, an NSF senior in 2017 to do a study among couples interacting at home, very much inspired by the self-study. So we're doing ethnography in the home and um, lots of interviews, but also video recording, watching them cook dinner, <laughs> lots of footage of TV, uh, as Larry is probably painfully aware, he's coding it right now. So um, the we also had a, a concurrent psychophysiology, it was a mobile-ish <laughs> psychophysiology unit with six electrodes called the Mindware, looking at heart rate variability um, during the whole time. So we have much, um, fewer couples than have been studied in labs, but much longer time with all of them. And, um, you know, right now we're still coding and analyzing the data, but the findings really emphasize the pragmatic co-emergence of emotion and physiological 
activity and interaction. And um, right now we're writing a paper, um, you know, about how an integrated approach like this, like from the design stage, not just an add-on, um, demonstrates, you know, it's not just an outcome that we're getting with the physio, um, nor does it necessarily predict how interactions will unfold. So a lot of lab research will, will um, have couples in the lab for 10 minutes and then measure their physiology, and then they'll have them take a test or a scale and see their relationship satisfaction and try to say something about the causal you know, directionality of this. And it's a really interesting debate and I, that I just completely don't understand because we have so much data and their physio changes so much and their interactions are so varied that this 10 minutes in the lab is supposed to be representative of their entire relationship. Um, but what we're really focused on right now is how each type of data affords an expanded interpretation of the complementary data. So we have um, interactions that when we look at the physio, um, we understand in a different way, right? It, it pushes us, it moves us to understand it. Oh, maybe they're not totally talking past each other now because their physio is like, there's something happening here. So we go and look at it further or um, what appears to me to index an argument, right? Based on what I know and what I'm familiar with and many years of studying interaction looks like, looks like they're having a, an argument bickering or whatever. And their physio is like really showing something different. And then we look at the interaction again and it's like, oh, that's like how they do intimacy, right? So, um, so from that, and uh, we want to thank Max DiCaro for the, for the art um, on our, it's like, we want to develop this even further. Like, so we developed this idea of biolinguistic. There's something called biolinguistic, which if you try to type biolinguistic, your autocorrect will always switch to. It's like a whole different field. But this is more biocultural medical and linguistic anthropology. Um, as a, an integrated field, both theoretically and methodologically, um, where we can understand how culture, biology, and experience co-emerge in moment to moment interaction. So this is the career research, and then I'm gonna get to ECHO because that's what um, the, the career award has a, um, a research component and a, and a pedagogy component. Um, but this is the research. Um, it's basically doing a similar study linking moment-to-moment -moment interaction with time match, physiological arousal and de-arousal within the home and beyond. So I wanted to extend it outside the home and I wanted to do um, couples to, to kind of extend that. Um, what I've gotten feedback from people in the first phase is that um, I don't wanna, we don't wanna exclude individuals, right? Because um, the, the community of practice that we are looking at our folks involved with embodied social justice in the US and China, um, which I'll explain in a minute. The methods are, again, are interviewing, video recording, and mobile, like really mobile psychophysiology. So a little less sensitive, but not, you know, we want to follow them for 10 days. So um, I came up with this term. There's lots of new terms for mobile ethnography, but participant-driven mobile ethnography. So using an app, um, we're really looking into using a time capsule approach where we do 10 people, 10 days, same 10 days, right? So we can orient to some of the same news items. And then embodied social justice is um, a range of practices focused on transforming the effects of injustice in the individual, right? So intergenerational trauma um, and the social body. And uh, it's also organized around practices and relationships that support participants in envisioning and co-creating a more just future. So it's, um, it's a field coming out of somatic psychotherapy, um, but it's just, it, it's incredibly biocultural, right, already. Um, and then I just, this is a, a quote that, um, that I use a lot and I wanted to have it here. Uh, in large, you know, bell hooks just passed away recently. 
Um, but it's a great way of, of, of just understanding how deep uh, language is in our body. And it's really intimate, like our relationship, we, we often don't think about it. Um, but she writes that like desire language disrupts, refuses to be contained within boundaries. It speaks itself against our will in words and thoughts that intrude and even violate the most private spaces of mind and body. So that's me is like, this is really important work. It's, it's really important to bring these fields together, I think, um, in the discipline. So how did I get to poor field? I'm totally focused on bio and Ling. I will explain that in a minute. So, so this is the pedagogy part of the career award where I said I would do a weekly um, lab in biolinguistic and um, we would develop uh, scalable, like bigger or smaller, right? Because the the NSF that we're doing is just really big. And, um, and in lieu of calling it the Blech Lab, which is the Biolinguistic Embodiment Communication and Health, um, we finally figured out the O, which I'm really happy about because that goes a lot better. Um, but really, when we're talking about embodiment, we're talking about both physiological processes as well as lived experience. and. Um, and the body's role in making sense of time, right? Uh, communication is not language as words. It's inclusive of language as words, but it's also looking at the relational process of communication. Um, micro interaction to um, circulating ideologies of language, circulating um, discourse in public health, all of that political language, Health really um, points to physical, emotional, psychological, and social well-being or lack thereof. Um, everyday health practices, and then institutionalized health care practices. And then open is the fun one because it really points to the intentional structure of of the lab of Echo as a as an organization. Um, it's open to all students, professors, researchers, and public stakeholders. We're figuring out now how to do a Zoom, like how to create a Zoom link that doesn't invite chaos. Um, <laughs> right. But we want to um, to collaborate, right? It's not a lab, it's a co-lab, right? It's collaborative research that is very much grounded in the openness of emergent strategy. Anyone familiar here with Adrian Murray Brown? Um, so a facilitator. Um, who who is part of the um, embodied social justice movement um, and uh, looks at the link between um, emergence in nature and then emergent strategy as a way of changing the world. So that that instead of having like a plan of how we're going to do this, um, we have we create the space for the relationship to emerge, and then we figure it out together. So it's a little like holding hands and jumping off a cliff, right? Because oftentimes in, in, um, in, in this particular society, in this institution, there's often, you have to have a plan, right, first. Um, but so the initial goals, anyone who's received the emails have seen this, right, is to think, feel, and experiment together about how to integrate biocultural and linguistic in specific research projects in an affordable way, right? For, especially for grad students, um, and um, and applied projects in education, healthcare, community activism. So again, the questions that began it were: How does culture get under skin, under the skin? But how is the world bodied by people, right? How does our genetic um, and experiential history, you know, inform the way that we show up in a particular interaction? Um, and how might this be a form of embodied social justice, right? Or just creating collaborations that participate in much of what DECO has focused on, right? Decolonizing the discipline in, in very methodological, practical ways. So here's where we're going for the fourth. Um, I am someone who does appreciate words. So I'm thinking about ECHO. Okay, so it is, you know, an acronym. 
but it's also a word. So I wanted to look up what, you know, what the word means. And it's because it's like it's not an echo chamber, right? Um, so yes, it's a repetition or imitation, a reflection, a repercussion. I kind of like that a little better. Um, as a verb, which is uh, anyone that's taken any of my Lingant classes know that our our main trick in Lingant is to turn nouns into verbs. So language, languaging, identity, identifying, right? Um, anthropology, anthropologizing, I don't know. Um, but so uh, the verb is to repeat or imitate, to restate and support. Oh my gosh, D, you're gonna, <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right, D has worked with me. I have written three papers now on, um, does anyone know the, recall the, uh, the physician in Wuhan who had uh, been persecuted and who, for sharing information? Okay, so his Weibo page is like, you know, his social media page has become, and it still is, uh, a space where people are comment, uh, there's over 100 million or, uh, I mean, right, so there's a hundred, more than a hundred, there's more than a million posts, replies to his final post years later. And so I've been doing some analysis of these data. And this one just really stuck out. So hui in, in Chinese is, is, is echo. I mean, that's it. It's literally to return sound, right? It is an echo. Um, but this one really like hit me uh, in terms of echo lab because um, this uh, participant wrote that your Weibo is an echo wall that cannot be found anywhere else. People seeking justice come here to resonate with each other. Your Weibo is a bonfire and countless travelers who travel in the dark come here to find light and warmth. So that's, that notion of echo is different, right? Like it's a, it gives us a different perspective that we can see in these definitions of a, reverber a reverberation. And so that got me thinking about um, resonant beyond bio and link, right? So um, echoes, so thinking in terms of past, present, and future is a, is a big part of linguistic anthropology. How do, we, can, how do we narrate the past? How do we envision the future? How do we situate ourselves in time? How do we organize time? This goes back to, you know, Warfian perspective on Hopi versus... Um, SAE, Standard Average European, whatever that was, right? So uh, English being part of that, how we configure time. But in terms of thinking about echoes of the past, I started to think about, you know, a Boazian approach really was four fields. I mean, the four fields kind of split off after that, um, after my grand advisor, Edward Spear, that's how young we are now. Um, I think the archaeologists probably have a better sense of that, but I think I think sometimes we forget how recent um, this has all happened. So um, the idea of anthropology as a holistic practice is very appealing, and so much has happened in the last hundred years, right? Uh, linguistic anthropologists sort of split off and got booted <laughs> from the field in the mid-century, and and really collaborated with a lot of sociolinguists and then came back, right? But uh, oftentimes Lingamp is associated with the Boazian approach to collecting grammars and myths and stories and tracking, tracking words, right? So a lot that has happened um, also in biocultural medical, many people in other disciplines. So a lot of really nuanced, exciting things I know in archeology span too have, have happened. And then um, there's this kind of subfield, sub, sub, sub field, sub, you know, even, and you get these really, really trained approaches um, that don't talk to each other. So I was like, how could we bring this back together? Um, and uh, echoes of the future is kind of like, what kind of future do we do we hear? Do we want to see? Right? Because we're this is a really um, fantastic moment to be thinking about, you know, I've been thinking about language and social justice as part of my um, practice for a long time. Um, but seeing it kind of expand in the world and in the discipline, it seems like a great time to think about, you know, what do we want to see? What do we want to contribute? What do we want to transform or 
unsettle even not even necessarily dismantle or or absolutely fundamentally change but just sort of push back on it even but like let's start at home right and and uh, ethnographies of the past you know i've wrangled with many archaeology students on trying to take some of the methods and concepts that we use in Lingamp to apply to data where you have um you know it's like Dr. Luo's research on, uh, on in history, these archives are sometimes incomplete and you don't have them, right? And so, so that helps me really think about, you know, how do we, you know, ideally we have video cameras and we're recording interaction, but if you can't do that, what can you do with the theory? What can you learn about? And um, what can you know about the communicative embodied experience of people in the past? But actually, one of the one of the areas where it's been really productive is thinking about the communicative embodied display of findings, right? So, the, if many here remember Mackenzie Manns, who wrote her masters uh, with me at the intersection of archaeology and linguistic anthropology, that um, she went to Circle Rock in North Carolina, and um, you know, uh, did a very originally was was going to focus on audio recordings of people walking through and did. But one of the really profound findings was the distinction between the signs and the kind of the, the ways in which the scientific language of the archaeologist explaining, right, participated in this um, temporal imagination of, of the, the, the way, way past. But the Eastern Band of Cherokee lives 30 miles down the road, right? So it's, it's, a, it's a placement of people in the past. And, um, and the font and the size and all of that on the sign by the archeologist was right next to a sign um, with, uh, with a different um, aesthetic that was written in the Cherokee syllabary. And then which one did people pay attention to when they were walking through, right? That scientific knowledge. Right, so that really opened up the space for like, this is um, these little things, you know, I, I'm thinking about uh, our museum studies affiliate program or program, <laughs> right? It, in museum studies, like how do we, how can we, you know, what can we offer to understanding this embodied experience? Because there are effects. It's not just, it's not just words, <laughs> right? It really is profound, uh, there are profound ramifications of the way we display our work. Um, but in ethnographies of the present, we're also looking at the past, right? So history is incredibly important, how the past permeates the present. And ethnographies of the future, that's kind of, that's kind of what I'm working on. I'm, I, I kind of want to just sum it up instead of explaining embodied social justice all the time. It's just ethnographies of hope. How do we feel hope? How do we live towards hope? How do we create a world or, you know, how do we, in a, in a world of hopelessness where we see uh, the suffering and we see the oppression, um, what keeps people going towards the future, the possible future? Um, and what an array of diverse possible futures people imagine. Um, so even though beyond anthropology, um, you know, history, gender and race studies, sociology, um, I'm thinking about theories and methods from the arts, right? So uh, uh, dance, literature, photography, um, and then also really thinking about how this whole project can be an, uh, uh, in conversation with in the integration of indigenous knowledge making practices that has to do with how we present, you know, how we come to know what we know. How do we, um, how do we tell stories, right? Research is, writing research is telling a story. So, um, so there's actually quite a bit of literature on that and um, formulating research that is collaborative, not in a sense of, you know, I, I, I don't fault community-based participatory research in medicine for, for being um, a, a, definitely a step forward. But I'm thinking instead of using theory um, you know, instead of looking at where these two theorists 
you know, Western theorists are arguing and where we can intervene, it is, it is helpful because those theories do have power. But understanding how each of us, every participant in our research is a theorist, right? And so maybe you can use those theories. Um, giving uh, ethnographic tools to participants to understand their world and intervene in it. So like really very applied, very collaborative, but also deeply theoretical too. It doesn't have to, this idea that applied anthro is, is not theoretical, I think is, is, is a misnomer. So here are my expanded tentative goals and I'm gonna put it up. And I, when I say at all, that means <laughs> you're all implicated, right? And especially the archeologist, um, because you know, I, I'm, I'm thinking really contemporary archeology span is what, where the, the self lab really um, was able to integrate. But like, what are, what are some of the other ways, if, even if it's not necessarily, you know, the, the theory, the way of understanding the material world, um, how does that, where, where does that fit in? So basically my new <laughs> explanation is integrating biological, cultural, linguistic, and archaeology in research projects, any site where people have bodies, <laughs> where they communicate, where they have health. <laughs> so, you know, I, I don't want it to expand too, too far, right? Because it because there, there is a very specific focus. And that's why I took the time to show you some examples of like, this is like a very, uh, you could do a specific research project on how language is policed. Inter and corrected and who's sent to a speech pathologist and what kids are classified as English language learners. And, and that constitutes this because it, it, it is, is it, from a biocultural perspective that has impact on health, right? So you can still do very focused projects, um, but take a health perspective, right? Take a biolinguistic perspective and, um, so the activities we've just added, I mean, it started, it started remotely in spring uh, 2021. And then I was on sabbatical in fall 2021. So now we're back in person, we do hybrid. Um, it, we've added the new methods week. So I think of it as um, I'm like, actually more than anything, a methods geek. I love playing with ways of knowing, right? And there's so much happening in methods, um, not just in anthro, but just so many cool things coming out. Um, I think all the presses are like, how many books are you gonna find in your classes? Cause you're getting a lot of review copies <laughs> of all the methods books. So like, let's just play, let's look at documentary filmmaking. Let's look at um, archival research. Let's look at um, all the different mobile apps, right? Let's, let me use some of the resources from the grant to to, um, to buy um, this tool or that tool and let's, let's all do it. Like, like let's all wear this, you know, this watch or use this app for a week and see what it would be like, right? So it's, it's a kind of play, method play, but we're also having focused discussions on the research design for students who are, you know, who are, who are at whatever stage in their research. How do I formulate a good research question? How do I make sense of all my data? How, you know, what, I've got to present this paper. Can I give you guys a, 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 a copy? And then we kind of workshop it together. Um, and, or if someone reads something that is relevant in any discipline or non-academic. Um, and then we have, uh, we're having two guest speakers uh, from, uh, we have uh, Sochi Marci Vargas from Emory and she's in the, English or linguistics department. She studied with um, Bauman and Briggs at Berkeley. I mean, she's an anthropologist, but we hide in places, you know? Uh, and uh, so her book that recently came out uh, is about listening genres. So how we learn to listen, which I think is really, really fascinating. So um, her work looked at a Brazilian um, psychotherapist, how they be learn to listen to patients and listen to the body. And it's like, I want to know about that in any, like, how do we listen to each other? How do I, how do we listen to students? How do we listen to professors? How do we listen to colleagues? How do we listen to participants? I think it's so, so super cool. So that's going to be, look out for that. Um, and then we also have uh, Dr. Gilly Hammer from, um, from uh, Israel, who is 
working on, she has done integrative dance, right? So you have the dance troops where you have people with um, different disabilities and abilities to dancing together, right? So you've seen some of these amazing dance troops, right? That, that if, you, if you haven't looked it up, because it's gorgeous. Um, so did a long ethnography of that and is now working in a center in, um, in Jerusalem where you have Israeli and um, Palestinian women uh, coming together to support one another. So fascinating stuff. But anyway, here are the details. It's Wednesday, 1 to 2.30. There was some confusion. It was 1.30. Uh, my own sections uh, got placed on Wednesday, so we had to change it. So it's at 1 to 2.30. It's in the Rojo Lab. If anyone uh, doesn't know where that is, it's really hard to find it's where Hberg is. Um, but uh, I think I'm going to like take pictures of the doors and stuff and actually put that on the on the website, but we're also doing Zoom and drop-ins are absolutely welcome anytime, whoever um, wants to show up and we're working on how to circulate that, that Zoom link. Um, but it's also, I set it up so that it is available for one to two credit hours for students, whether grad or undergrad, because um, so if you need a couple of credits uh, towards the degree, um, or you just, you don't, you know, you want to get some credit for it, that, that's possible. Um, and we have open signups. So I don't know who's seen the email. There's always a link to like a Google page, but we have these, these methods weeks, um, which one methods week, this, this recently led to another methods week because, you know, <laughs> a student said, well, what if we run out of methods? No. Yeah. I mean, it, I was just like, oh no, what are we going to do? And then I had just like started going down the rabbit hole. I'm like, nope, <laughs> it's never going to happen. I kind of want to make it the, the MECO lab, right? Like methods. No, MECO. Oh, sorry. <laughs> this is okay. So, um, so there's also a core email list and that is useful if you want to be added. Most of the time we've been circulating a something that the person wants us to read together or, um, but we have that core email list for folks who want to come, uh, who want to circulate something like in progress paper or something like that and don't want it going to the entire anthro department and other departments on campus. Um, one of the things I wanna do is create some sort of um, non-obligatory umbrella uh, uh, situation where we collaborate. So we have on our website, you know, official collaboration with um, like my friend's lab at MIT and the UCLA discourse lab, all of that. Um, so, so that's going to be, you know, so that we can expand our network and really be open. I mean, just open. Like it's, it's, it's focused, but open. <laughs> okay. That's it. Thank you. <laughs> Yeah, 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 yeah. Absolutely. Oh, wow. Yeah, no, that's actually like really relevant. <laughs> Yeah. Thanks, Bailey. <laughs> yeah, so this is like when I say uh, it, you know, it's everyone, Mike, uh, my PhD student, Bailey. Um, you know, Jason is like, it's really interesting when your co PI and your main collaborator becomes there. <laughs> oh, that was, uh, it was really, um, but, you know, he's, he's in every thing I'm, writing here, right? He's, uh, the biocultural, you know, one of the things that Tom Weisner, one of my mentors and um, 
friends, professors at UCLA has written about in, um, in mixed methods, you know, how do we do, uh, thanks Alex, um, how do we do mixed methods well, right? Because interdisciplinary mixed methods research is really complex. Um, and it's really, it's, it's hard when we're talking past each other. I mean, literally, that would be a great Lance project, right? To, to look at people from different disciplines trying to, trying to collaborate. Um, but one of the lessons that um, Tom Weisner really um, drilled home in, um, he was in the Psychiatric Institute at UCLA and in the Anthro department. And, um, and so he had a lot of experience with this. It's like, how do we really honor the expertise of, the, of, of, of our collaborators and defer, right? And, um, and yet become curious, even, even if it's within the subfield where we think we know what it is. Um, and, um, and so from the outset, and I should say, Josh Peterson is in communication studies and that's a different college, which is really interesting. Um, and uh, they have a lot of affinity with psychology, but then there's also quite a lot that overlaps with uh, Lingam. And so Josh and Jason and I have really, like there's never been uh, any kind of hierarchy. It was kind of like this, um, we just started talking and then one thing, you know, kind of led to the other. And it's really frustrating to apply for their career because you have to apply as an individual when you're doing this collaborative work. And so Josh and Jason are both, you know, consultants or co-eyes or whatever I could do. No, you can't even have co-eyes. Right, so it's, this is the this is a model that I want to disrupt too in terms of authorship, which is why it's not at all right. It's all of us. We're all speaking. I'm just vocalizing it, and that's often time what we're doing anytime we're having a conversation. You know, every word has. I have this Bakhtin quote in my head. Every word has a flavor. It has a history. It has a taste it, of of a profession of a of a relationship. So every time we're speaking, we're like re circulating um, some kind of some kind of history and um, and so how do we how do we learn to listen that's why I'm so glad that Shoshi is coming because um, I, I'm so excited to think about that further as collaborative research in mixed methods where you say like you are the archaeologist you know you are the expert on that uh, I don't actually want to pretend that I am going to become an expert in fact, there was a recent thing about which bioculture I used to teach in the sort of circulating biocultural core class. And it's like, no, I'm not going to do that. <laughs> like, I don't, I, I actually, y'all have it. Like, I don't need to be an expert. When you have really a, a fantastic colleagues, you don't need to be an expert. But how do we create the relational container and that sort of situated understanding of one another to, to be able to do work that isn't you know, that doesn't lead to, to conflict or, or, or navigating conflict. How do we, yeah, I mean, emergent strategy is huge with that. Restorative justice, how do we navigate instead of running from conflict or, you know, creating. And so I have, I have dreams about like what kind of environment, how we can coordinate with Deco, Fable and Hberg and like just have it kind of become, um, something bigger but one step at a time <laughs> come to echo <laughs> see Oh, sure. Um, yeah, I'll just full disclosure. This is like my bestie in in classical. Um, so yes, we do. Thank you, Dave. Uh, send out. Uh, we basically have signups open. So next week, uh, Mike uh, Santana is going to be presenting. Um, and uh, this last week we had no one, so uh, so we were really interested in time capsule methods because I'm thinking about it and. Um, <laughs> it took me forever to find out 
I was like, I should have asked you guys, maybe. Did you know that documentary ha have these time capsule? That's what they call it. So I have Googled everything, contemporaneous, simultaneous, video, uh, no, time capsule. Okay, so we watched Life in a Day. So we send out the email um, on it, uh, uh, the topic. Um, we should have you come. Uh, Dee has just, this is exciting. Uh, her book is now in press uh, uh, on um, literacy. And if any know, anyone knows Chinese history, she studies 1890 to 1949 in China. So that's some, that's some complicated historical data to access in many of those years and a lot going on, um, but studying literacy. So very, very lenient in terms of um, literacy in the promotion of um, like nationalist sort of let's become literate and beat the communists, let's become literate and beat the West, let's become literate and beat Japanese. I mean, you know, thinking about citizenship, um, but then also looking at the everyday uh, ways in which citizens engage differently. Like it's, it's not like this uh, Althusserian hegemonic totalizing, you know, uh, personal fan pieces. Yes, I mean that's a good that's a good tactic. Yeah, but what's great is that you know. Um, but to I mean maybe you could present to us too. I've kind of kept it in anthro, but yeah, we'll send out a, an email with if the person wants to link. They're coming from Mike usually or Bailey, um, but from Missy really, um, unless you're on the. If you're on the core email list, you're getting two, but it is that way because for those times when we have, you know, someone who's, who wants to keep something tight. Um, but yeah, they'll, um, we can just sign up. Oh, Brett, awesome, awesome. yay. <laughs> um, so uh, yeah, so if you want to sign up, sign up. Um, our methods weeks kind of ate up a lot when you're only doing weekly and then um, and then our guest speakers, you know, organizing that. Uh, and then that, but we have a couple weeks open, I think in one and two weeks and then another time. And, and, uh, and sometimes we've just had open discussions. Um, Sure, yeah. I would love that. I would love that. And, um, you know, if anyone knows anyone on campus that wants to be, we have folks in the nerd lab, the neuroscience and education research. Um, and we have some in Ling, you know, in the linguistics minor, a bunch of us, um, College of Education. But yeah, if anyone knows anyone or, has any ideas like it is oh Ben like we are open to really thinking about it but they're also doing it with care right not blowing up you know right away and and having emergent strategy like tender careful um but not too fast <laughs> Thank you guys. Thank you so much. Yeah. Okay. And join us next time.